Good evening to all of you as we gather tonight for a service of comfort in the shadow of lament. Lamentation is an ancient spiritual practice by which we trust that the hopes and fears of all the years are met in God's grace. In a season both alive with beauty but also fraught with grief, loneliness, and strained relationships, we offer this sacred space as a balm for your soul. There is power in gathering as God's beloved community, as together we hold the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. As the carol sings, and you beneath life's crushing load whose forms are bending low, O oh, rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing. Tonight we will receive stories that speak to the human experience and music that tends to the heart. I give thanks to Marion Drake, Susan Sodek, and David Greer for their reflections this evening. As a reminder to all worshiping with us in person, please do remain masked. Beloved community of First Congregational United Church of Christ, let us now cross the threshold into sacred time with the centering song, Be Still. Let us sing. I'd like to invite you to join me in the candle lighting litany of remembrance. I'll be the one, and I ask you to be the many. We light this candle to call forth hope, vulnerable as a flickering flame. We see the world as it is, awash in beauty and brokenness. We dare to hope God will come to us again. We light this second candle to call forth the peace of God's holy, healing presence. We see the world as it is, at war, flush with guns, yet also fierce with love. We long for the peace that passes all understanding. We light this third candle to call forth divine joy. We live in the world as it is, marked by loss and common sorrow, yet warm with comfort. We yearn for the joy of God's presence. We anticipate the coming of the promised one of old, light of the world, hope of glory, healer of nations, wonderful counselor,
Prince of Peace. May our hearts prepare room to receive Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3 and 10 and 11. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The God of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. First Church. It's much easier to sing in front of you than to speak in front of you. I will start tonight by saying I am not a Christmas person. In fact, I would say for the last 20 years or so, I would say I do not like Christmas. There, I've said it. I'm going to say it again, I do not like Christmas. I'm grateful to Reverend Amanda for asking me to speak tonight because unlike most years, um, this year since she called, I've been thinking about why. And I've been sitting with that discomfort rather than suppressing it. First, there's the presence part. For anyone who's read that book about love languages, gift giving is definitely not mine. I really struggle to find the gift that's right for people and um, I feel bad or inadequate, especially fearing you know, that they may be disappointed in what I've given them. But there's another deeper reason that I've settled on for why doing Christmas is something I don't like and in fact actually causes me pain. So back to that love languages idea. My love language is spending time. I don't know if that's exactly the right phrase in the book. I should have gone back and checked, but it's the love language where you just, you love someone because you are with them and you do things with them. That's how you express love and that is how you receive love. So the most spending is time person in my life is my grandmother, Janie Drake, my paternal grandmother, who is 104 years old and still living. Um, she is probably the most important person in my life. I grew up in a small town in Ohio, about a half a mile away from my grandmother's house. Uh, it's the house that my grandmother, my grandfather, my father, and his older brother and sister had moved to in 1960 when they left Texas for Ohio for my grandfather to take a job. Actually, it's also the town next door to the town where my grandmother grew up. So it's a place where she is very centered and rooted. So my grandfather tragically um, died very young, he well, unexpectedly died at 59, and so my grandmother has been widowed for, for decades and lived in that house um, for many, many years until probably 10 to 15 years ago when she moved into a retirement community. But during the whole time I was growing up, I spent time with her, a lot of time with her. I was the youngest grandchild and one of only two girls, and I definitely benefited from that. <laughs> I, den I benefited from being the one who was always around. Most of our spending time was just going to the local IGA and picking up whatever we needed for lunch, sitting on her carport, drinking 
iced tea and rocking in her, in her glider, visiting the cemetery to leave flowers for my grandfather and for her baby brother who she had lost when she was eight and for her mother who she had lost when she was 17 and for her father. These were the kind of things that my grandmother and I did. We spent a lot of time also at Christmas, and that spending time was getting ready for Christmas. This started first off with Christmas cookie baking. That was the first day of Christmas vacation from school, and there was definitely a routine. Uh, my grandmother had sort of an unheated lean-to off of her kitchen, which was her pantry. And we would first start by going and digging through the pantry for the cookies left over from last year, which actually sometimes tasted kind of OK. So sometimes we'd have a couple of those before we started. We definitely would dig out the fruitcake, because no one ever ate the fruitcake from Corsicana, Texas, except me and my grandma. Um, it was good, though. So we would start first maybe finding the old cookies. And then we had an order. We made the certain cookies. We always made the apricot balls. And we made the jam thumbprint cookies that she called sunbuckles. And we made the special K bars because my grandma liked them and no one else ate them. And the forgotten cookies, which I don't, I don't even know why we made those, because you put them in the oven and then you forgot they were there and they were meringues. Anyway, we made the cookies. We drank constant comment tea. We talked. It, figured, it turns out you can burn chocolate chips when trying to melt them in the microwave if you're not paying attention. We just spent time. Baking cookies was followed by decorating, doing some decorating, getting out the old crash, finding the greenery, and then buying the Christmas tree. We would buy, uh, my parents would buy their Christmas tree and also my grandmother's Christmas tree at the now what would be the shockingly late date of December 20th. Um, and then we would decorate that tree. And the best part of the Christmas celebration for me was Christmas Eve, when we would go to church in town, and then we would walk home from church to my grandmother's house, and we would have set out before church a big punch bowl that had the eggnog in it. It was a weird green punch bowl that had sort of ivy around the side. And we'd serve the eggnog and the toasted pecans, as my grandma said that she would have toasted in advance. And of course, the fruit cake and all the cookies we had made. And usually, my uncle would bring his guitar, and we'd sing Christmas carols and just, just hang out, have a nice time on Christmas Eve. We might go out, walk around town, and look at the Christmas lights. So. Thinking about this spending time is just not what my life is like now as an adult. Uh, I haven't spent that kind of time with my grandmother since sometime in my 20s. And at this time of year now, I'm reminded even more of my just visceral reaction to uh, being scheduled and just resisting and thinking about the things I have to do and them looming over my mind. Everything about the, the season, it seems to me, uh, right now is the, basically the opposite of spending time. It's just, I don't know how my grandmother could sustain it because she could sustain this spirit and this energy and this joy that I, I cannot find in my reserves. And I feel responsible, like I should know, like I should know how to do that and I can't. I guess that's, that's the part that's probably most difficult for me is that I'm torn between the desire to take the time to just do normal things to make cookies, to talk, to drink tea, in the expectation that I should be rallying to do something much more significant. So as I said, I, I don't know how she did it or where she drew it from. She's still here. She's 104 years old. Just in the last year, she has uh, lost the, 
her, her, the use of her legs and her hands, but she sits um, all day in her assisted living. And I think she's a little bored. She's a little lonely. She told me recently, you know, when I moved in here, I thought that people would visit each other because our rooms are right next to each other, but no one visits. And I think that's been a little disappointing for her. And I think really what I want to be doing right now is just uh, spending that time with her. Thank you. A reading from John 1, verses 1 through 5 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was in the beginning with God. All things were made through the Word, and without the Word was not anything that was made. In the Word was life, and the life was the light of all. The light shines in the deepest night, and the night has not overcome it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth.
Hello, everybody. About a week ago, I had a bad cold. It's gone, but somehow my voice has not come back. So bear with me. It is the season. Christmas lights are everywhere, and I'm decorating my tree with ornaments that evoke strong memories. I'm beginning to cook my favorite recipes in anticipation of my family arriving from all over the country. That's all good, but there's still a hollow in my heart. I, I can't help thinking of Manuel and Celestina from Venezuela. I met them in the basement of Luther Place when I delivered shoes donated by our church for the immigrants arriving by busloads sent by Governor Abbott in Texas to teach our government about the burdens of dealing with people flooding his border. It's an undeniable political crisis, but more than that, it's a heart-wrenching human crisis. In that church basement, I reached out a hand to shake Manuel's. He took it, but he wouldn't let go. For at least half an hour, gripping my hand, he poured out his hopes and the story that brought him to that moment. He was a laborer in Venezuela, married to Celestina, and a father to two children, four and two. With President Maduro's policies, he saw the job market shrink, and it was like dry bones. So with no seeming options, the family left the country and crossed the border into Colombia. You all know the journey to the U.S. border. The news stories never stop. But when someone is holding your hand and telling his story, you wonder how a human has the endurance. The most horrible part of the story was visualizing them with the two kids on their backs crossing the 60-mile-wide Darien Gap in Panama, which can only be done on foot through jungle and swamp. They knew the threats, the weight of the two children slowing the passage, the small amount of food and water they'd be able to carry, and the coyotes that would meet along the way who demanded money for safe passage or even higher prices if he offered them as a personal guide with more, more food and water. His hands gripped mine harder and then released over and over again as if he wanted me to really feel that journey. It was the hope of a life changing welcome in America that kept them moving. I've read UNICEF reports that say that about two million migrants have crossed through that Darien Gap. But the trip was not always torturous. There were angels along the way. Manuel can't remember who they were, but food was shared, doctors attended, and local people appeared with shoes and clothes and water. They crossed Panama, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico, and finally the bridge over the Rio Grande to the United States to ask for asylum. Perhaps because of their family, they were granted a future court date and offered a bus ticket to Washington, D.C. At 7 a.m. on October 3rd, they stepped off their 20-hour bu bus trip into the park that's opposite Union Station. With no idea where they were, and what was going to happen. The DMV mutual aid group of volunteers hugged each one of them, and then volunteers in their own cars drove them over to Luther Place for a hearty breakfast, a shower, and a shopping trip through the basement tempor temporary secondhand donated clothing room. The children were welcomed by Spanish-speaking volunteers to a separate room set up with bouncy balls and tricycles and books and Legos. Manuel and Celestina 
filled out intake forms, and then sat quietly in a corner awaiting next steps. And that's where I had met them. Could I finally be the person that offered them safety? Could I offer a plan for the future? Stability for the family? Peace in their hearts? No, I, I'm not that person. Just a speck among the swarm of angels doing the only work we know how to, God's work in the face of injustice. As for Manuel and Celestina and the kids, I know that they chose to live in DC. I know that through First Church's generosity, they're wrapped in warm clothing. And I know that because of regional church advocacy in our city, our mayor has agreed to establish a welcome center and temporary housing for the bus migrants. And that continues to be true, but our city could do better. How about expedited work permits, affordable housing, and health care? Manuel's gripping hand is the hollow in my heart. Si Dios quiere, God willing, with my and our prayers and action, Manuel and family and those that follow him will find their peace.
friends, we've come to the time now when we are going to invite you forward to share the light from one of our Advent candles, the candle of hope or the candle of peace or perhaps the candle of joy and use it to kindle a votive. You may light it for someone you love as a sign of hope in difficult circumstances, as a prayer for peace where there is violence, as a sign of your own inner light. You may light it for gratitude or joy. As you light your candle, you are welcome. You don't have to, but you are welcome to speak a name, word, or phrase describing why you light it. As you come forward, remember you are not alone. Others go before you and behind you. Together, our light grows. There are some wooden sticks right there. You can use those to take light from the Advent candle to light your votive. Please feel free to come forward as the Spirit moves you.
Let us pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good evening. So when Amanda asked if I'd be, if I would like to speak uh, the Blue Christmas service, I uh, initially had a little bit of question or like, what am I going to talk about? I didn't know exactly what I would talk about. Since she's asked me, I have thought of, I think, three examples of Blue Christmas. First, they pertain to me, and then to my family, and then to community. The first one, I hope that you will find the humor, as I do. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, um, I was the youngest in my family. And uh, it was Christmas, so this is 1977. I was in seventh grade. And being the youngest, you're used to looking up and what your brothers and sisters are doing. And so I firmly decided that I was out of elementary school, I was in junior high school now, and I was an adult. And I was not going to have any toys for Christmas. Guess what? She listened to me. And I didn't get any toys for Christmas. And I was literally traumatized. <laughs> It was the first time I ever felt truly outside of the embrace of Christmas, and I was angry, and I, you know, all of these feelings. I want to tell you that to this day, some 45 years later, I have always asked for a toy for Christmas every year since. <laughs> Whether whether I get it from a, a spouse or a, a friend or I buy it myself, I get a toy for Christmas. But that was the first, my first example of a blue Christmas. My second one is with my family, and it is truly a tragedy. Um, on Christmas Day in 2018, my, uh, my sister's family had been celebrating Christmas and they, in Falcon, Colorado, just outside Colorado Springs. And... Uh, my sister's youngest son, my nephew, was planning a hunting trip up in western Nebraska, and he wanted to beat the, um, there was a storm coming, and he wanted to beat the storm. So at the end of the day, he had gone upstairs, my sister was asleep, and he asked for his permission to leave, and she was pretty much half asleep, and she granted her the permission for him to go, and they did not beat the snowstorm, and so they were driving up just outside of Denver, over a bridge, the car spun out, and Danny was not driving, he was sleeping in the back, and the car rolled, and he was thrown from the car 20 feet, and this is Christmas Day. So he was um, thrown 20 feet, and in that uh, 20 feet, when he landed, he severed his spine completely. So his ability to move was no, no ability to move, and it was dark of night, and there was, and it was a snowstorm. The driver was not injured and able to get to a house and get, you know, some the ability to call 911 and get cops there. But they didn't find Danny for four or five hours, and luckily there was. You know, and I don't know if he's passed out. I still don't know the full story, but they were able to, to find him. One of the lights was thrown from the car, and it was right near him, and they, that's how they found him. So Christmas at my sister's house 
has a very different meaning these days. It's the anniversary of a very tragic event in her family's, you know, life. And, uh, you know, I, I, we all kind of talk around it. We don't, you know, and thankfully Danny uh, was able to get married this summer, so that's a great joy. That's a great joy. But I'll tell you, it's a, we don't approach Christmas the same way that we did before that. And then the final one is about community. And this is what initially, I think Amanda had asked me to talk about. I grew up in Colorado Springs, and it is the site of the most, not the most recent, there's already been, what, two more mass shootings, uh, but was the site of the mass shooting of the LGBTQ club in Colorado called Club Q. Five people were murdered, and I think 20 other people were uh, injured. And I'll tell you, the, um, what st struck home, so is, I grew up in Colorado Springs, and I know, I can tell you how much gay spaces mean in places like Colorado Springs. Um, when I was growing up in the 80s, um, you would go, and I remember you were kind of used to a certain sense of being hunted. Uh, you would go to a gay bar in Colorado Springs, and on you got used to knowing there'd be a it could be a police raid, so you had to learn how to get out of the bar real quick. You usually brought a fake ID because you didn't want to bring your real ID if you got carded. Um, and then on Friday and Saturday nights, I remember you could count on the military being there and looking at license plates of service members so that they could go back and discharge you, essentially, throw you out. Although now, today, I think it's even worse. Um, Colorado Springs has become a haven. It's been a haven for white evangelicals for 40 years. But as that movement has become radicalized, it's now a movement for white Christian nationalists. And he was the, the shooter, the perpetrator in that, was a white Christian nationalist. And so that those gay spaces mean 10 times more in a community where you're under so much persecution uh, than, say, here in large, major urban areas. I'm not saying discrimination is not rampant everywhere, but the acceptance in a large urban area is so different than it is in these small urban towns. It really is two Americas. So I think, I think quite a bit about those folks and their, their space has really been shattered. You know, I imagine it would be tough going there again. I don't know if it's reopening. People may have heard, I don't know. It's even going to reopen, but their space has been shattered, and that, I imagine, is, is going to be very difficult to overcome. And then I've thought about them at this Christmas. How are they going to survive? How are they going to work through the emotions at this Christmas? This was less than 30 days ago. It's a blue Christmas for the survivors of the shooting of Club Q. So those are my examples of Blue Christmas, and I hope that all of us, you know, my only advice on Blue Christmas is I think we need to stop asking so much from this holiday. I think we want it to answer so much for us. We want it to answer joy and family coming together and being happy and abundance and we create this unreal expectation that this holiday can never meet. I think we need to sort of let Christmas off the hook and give it a break, you know, and just let it be a friend who sits by us and spends time with us.
For all of the exquisite offerings given so freely tonight, I am truly grateful. Before we depart from this sacred time together, I want to invite you to join us for our Christmas cantata, a worship service of music on Sunday morning, as well as our Christmas Eve candlelight service at 530. Please reach out to invite any family or friends who might need an opportunity to experience God's love this Christmas. And now for our final blessing. Beloved community, as we wait for the word made flesh to be born in this weary world, may every heart, including yours, prepare Christ's room. Go in peace. Amen.